Hope you met somebody uh, very interesting in the break, and you guys are well on the way uh, on your way to solving the world's problems. Um, but we're now going to get on to our next uh, segment, which is going to be uh, a so-called roundtable discussion, which will take place in the conspicuous absence of a roundtable of any kind. Um, <laughs> all right. So this next panel is about the incentive structure or incentive structures in higher education and how they impact the scientists and engineers we count on to communicate the critical advancements in their respective fields. During this discussion, we will learn about the research in higher education around promotion and tenure, a topic I know a lot of you care a lot about. And our group of scientists and engineers will highlight their experiences communicating about their research. But first, we have an introductory video, so let's take a look at that. My path to tenure was a bit unusual. 10 years as a research scientist before I got a full professor position. My first conference presentation was in front of a thousand people. I scripted the beginning of my talk. I ended up memorizing that. But I got about 30 seconds in and I couldn't remember what the next words were and it froze up and then started you and had living off the top of my head and it went much smoother and I just realized, my God, I've got to get better at this. So I've, I've pursued communication training ever since. When I started, people asked why. You can't put it on your CV. It's, it's not helpful towards tenure. I think the landscape has changed. There's so much more access to information, but I also think that has the flip side of having a lot more information you need to cut through in order to get your message out there. 10, 15, 20 years ago, people hoped that you, know, you do good science and it'll eventually trickle out and have an impact. But for science to have an impact, and that's what I ultimately got into this business for, uh, requires effective communication. I study tight wads and spendthrifts. I've been pretty lucky over the years that both the media and other academics have been interested in my work. and. Press coverage was a big component of my tenure research statement. The coverage uh, ranged from The Economist and NPR to outlets like Glamour and MTV. I'm someone who cares about impact, so I care about all of these outlets. MTV is as exciting as NPR. You know, I, I, I do err on the side of agreeing to too many interviews. You never know how someone's gonna learn about your work, so I try to cast a wide net. Academics read things like Glamour. Sometimes we watch MTV. Plus, reporters sometimes ask questions that can spark a, a new idea, like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So some colleagues, for many reasons, will make fun of you for doing this, but most are supportive. So I think it's been worthwhile. I, I'd encourage it, take some chances with it, and try not to keep your work a secret. Promotion and tenure decisions are perhaps the most explicit expression of our academic culture. As a dean, as a leader of a very interdisciplinary college, I had the opportunity to really expand our conversation about what is impact as it relates to promotion and tenure. Early on, there were two packages. One was well-cited articles published in high-impact journals, and we all agreed this was high-impact work. The second one turned out to be more controversial. Imagine it was actually in journals that were explicitly targeting practitioners. What it made us confront was what's impact. Is it highly cited journals, or is it ensuring that the work that you do actually gets in the hands of people that can use them. In a healthy academic culture, I'd argue that it's actually both. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this next session, Andy Hoffman. Andy is a professor of sustainable enterprise at the University of Michigan. All right, fun fact about Andy is uh, before he was a professor, he was a carpenter and general contractor of very large custom homes, as large as 29,000 square feet. And now I understand your career in sustainability is like a form of penance for this. Okay, Andy, over to you. Yeah. Okay, my slides, slide, slide up. <clears throat> Those aren't my slides. <laughs> Can 
name is Andy Hoffman. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I teach in a business school. Uh, I teach organizational behavior. And there's a paper that finds its way into pretty much every MBA organizational behavior class, and it's from 1975 by someone named Stephen Kerr, and it's called On the, Re uh, on the Folly of Rewarding A While Hoping for B. And the gist of the article is, if you're looking at behaviors of your employees and they're not doing what you want to do, look at the reward system. And if you want to change what they're doing, change the reward system. And that's the focus of our panel today. We are trying to deal with the folly in academia. Uh, tenure and promotion, annual review, the reward systems has come up a number of times among the audience, and it comes up in surveys as well. You can see survey data here that people do not believe there are personal benefits for investing in engagement. We did a survey of University of Michigan faculty and found that uh, 54, 56% believe that this activity was not valued by tenure committees, 41% believe it is time consuming and distracting, and 34% believe it is dangerous. That third bullet point I think is important though, <laughs> young people want to do it. And they're coming into academia and they want to change the world around them and so they eventually, you know, uh, science moves along one funeral at a time, was said yesterday, and this is an issue that we'll see if young people can change academia. So what we're going to talk about today, we have five panelists, and we're going to talk about different aspects of incentives of rewards. And this is very important. This is really the holy of holies of the academy. This is a statement about who we are, what we do, why we do it, what we value. And if we don't change the rewards, nothing's going to change. It's that simple. And so this, this conversation, this topic, I think is critically important. The topics on the table, uh, each people are going to hit uh, various aspects of, I tried to break it down into a two by two matrix. Uh, the whole world can always be broken down into a two by two matrix. <laughs> and um, incentives can be formal and informal, and the motivations can be intrinsic or e extrinsic. In that first box, we have to talk about tenure and promotion, annual review, journal publishing, and how is that changing, and then training. And of course, a lot of the focus, I think, is going to be on this box. But we should also think about the informal extrinsic rewards. Uh, you can gain greater visibility, and this can help your, um, your, your status within the university. But there also is concerns about whether you suffer from what's called the Carl Sagan syndrome, whether you will be mocked or dismissed as a popularizer, as a hack, or you might be seen as a media hound, just trying to get attention for yourself. On the intrinsic formal side, this can change your research strategy. In fact, I think some people will argue it has to. It can't be separate, otherwise, as come up already, we have a, a lot of stuff on our plate already. And it can help you reach new audiences. And then intrinsic informal, it gives you a sense of meaning and purpose. And these intrinsic motivations are important because some people are engaging despite the lack of extrinsic rewards. They're doing it because they believe that's what they're supposed to do, it's their purpose, it's their mission and that drives a lot of people, I think, here on the stage as well. So there's our focus, there's the structure. Uh, when I think about this issue, uh, we're trying to change the institutions of the academy, and that is a big ship to turn. And the process is very much like a diffusion S-curve, and we're at the beginning of the curve. And will it be stillborn and die, or will it hit that steep up curve and start to grow? And so I look for signals of change, that give me some hope that people are paying attention. And I just want to offer some here before turning to our speakers. The first is that we're seeing more attention from high-level administrators. Uh, on, on the Sackler lecture number four, I'd love to see more presidents, more deans, more provosts, more funders, uh, the people that really have their finger on the institutions. But this was a conference we ran at the University of Michigan on this topic, and the opening panel was four university presidents talking about how, how academia has to be much more engaged in public and political discourse. We can also see some institutions starting to get involved, and this is a report done by the American Sociological Association of trying to figure out how do we evaluate public communication and tenure promotion, We're trying to answer this question. We have groups coming forward and trying to develop rigorous me um, metrics for engagement, and some pretty important donors in there trying to figure out how do you put a number on this. We all have an H index, we all have our citation counts and so forth, what alternative metrics may be available for understanding our impact in the real world? 
We have some schools, like my own at the University of Michigan, the Ross School of Business, changing their annual review process, where we have the typical research, teaching, and service. The Ross School of Business has added a fourth criteria called practice. How are you impacting the world of practice? And for, it's different for different disciplines. For us, it's the world of business. And some institutions are starting to change their tenure and promotion. And here's an announcement from the Mayo Clinic starting to include um, uh, social media and engagement in their tenure and promotion. So, and then, and then finally, we do have changes within uh, the journals. Uh, Jerry Davis, who, my colleague who you heard yesterday, is heading up an initiative to try and get the academic, the A journals of business management to start to focus on more issues of empirical relevance. It's much more easy to engage in public discourse if you're doing research that the public actually cares about. And so that's just some beginnings to get us kicked off. Uh, our speakers are in order on stage here, and uh, they will each have four minutes to get some ideas on the table. Uh, that's <laughs> going to be very quick, um, but we're going to give it a shot and see where I can go.